You know, you got three chapters in 1 Thessalonians. The first three chapters, it's all about the exchange, the interchange, the relationship that Paul had with the Thessalonians. Right. And it seems like he's droning on and on about, I wanted to come see you, and you're desirous to see me, and you know, and you ministered to me, and, and then there's our brother here, and, and we just said, you know, it's so wonderful that we know you, and you know us, and we're going to come see you soon. It's like three chapters of this? You get to chapter 4, and you see the context is the rapture of the church. So much the more as you see the day approaching, do we need to be together and nurture strong relationships with each other. The Lord knows exactly what he's doing. And I am strengthened by being around you. I love the church. I love God's people. You know, uh, a man in the church taught me how to elk hunt. Man in the church taught me how to fish. Levi Lorenz took me out in the yard. We got under his Toyota, and he ta- taught me how to turn wrenches and take starters off and change out alternators. People in the church, you're my family. You're my family. So much the more. So much the more. Appreciate you. I do. And I need to stop that because this is actually a hard sermon, and I'm about to cry. You ever have a sermon you don't want to preach? You know, but then the Lord lays it on your heart. Well, the, you know, the way you do is you get up here and you say, oh, the Lord laid this on my heart. Right? You, you realize what that sounds like, right? I had another sermon. It was perfectly expository, and, and it, it, all the points came together. I got great poems, great, great quotes, funny illustrations. Philippians chapter 4, my fa- uh, favorite chapter to preach. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I'm not preaching it. And, uh, but if this sermon stinks, I can just blame it on God. <laughs> because the Lord laid this on my heart. You know? Don't people say that to you? The Lord showed me this. Don't blame that on God. Yeah. You know? Hey, look what the Lord showed me out of the Bible. Okay, so even if I don't agree, I can't say anything. <laughs> if happily I be found to fight against God. You know? <laughs> Little trick, isn't it? Matthew chapter 12, uh, Romans chapter 12, excuse me, not Matthew, not Matthew. I, I never preach out of Matthew. I don't, it shouldn't even be in my Bible. And, and uh, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 16, be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend, not condescend. Condescend. To men of low estate, be not wise in your own conceit. I think it's obvious in the immediate context here how a Christian's attitude should be toward fellow believers and towards all men. Obviously, we should be of the same mind, which is a mind that is renewed after Christ. In verse 2, he says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not Robert to be equal with God, but Took upon himself the form of a servant. We understand the mind that we're to have. And he said, I want you to be of the same mind. If we all had Christ's mind, the problem is, is we want people to be of our mind. We've created a God, a Christ in our own image. And we're frustrated because the people we minister, and we're not allowed to rubber stamp them in the image of our spirituality and Christianity. And so we get frustrated with them. You know, We understand that they're probably part of the apostasy because they're not as spiritual as us. But if we all had Christ's mind, I think we'd get along just fine. Be of the same mind one toward another. And uh, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. And so we we can infer a lot of things. We are not to operate according to that high wisdom, that higher criticism that seeks to excuse our behavior in light of revealed truth. Sure, mind not high things. All right, why? Because wisdom is before him that hath understanding, but the eyes of the fool are in the uttermost parts of the earth. And we travel uh, hither and yon to find education and wisdom. You know, we're like the Beatles and go to India to find a wisdom that can overthrow and overrule and excuse our rejection of the truth that's in a Bible right in front of us. We do that all the time. 
And uh, it's just philosophy is what it is. And we could talk about that, but, you know, as we step back, we can see that this chapter refers to the attitude or the mindset or the method of how we minister both to Christians within and without, verse 5, so we being many are one body in Christ, and everyone members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, and you understand that he's exhorting us to use our gifts to minister uh, toward each other. And then, of course, after verse 16, he talks more about our attitude towards those that are without. And as you can see, I got that from Dr. Schofield. Right? <laughs> but it's true. You can take this verse right off the top, and you can understand some things. That it wouldn't be wrong to apply it in the sense that we're not to have an uppity attitude. We're not to be occupied with the finer things, the more sophisticated things that alienate us from those that we ought to be ministering to. Oh, yeah. We're going to make it a point to be a minister to the common man. The common people heard him gladly. Amen. I I, I, thank you, Lord, Father. You've hid these things. And the wise and prudent hath revealed them to babes. Not many mighty, not many wise, not many noble are called. Oh, God has chosen the base things of the world to confound the wise. I think it's fair that a pastor should not be known as a high roller. Amen. You want to know the number one thing I hear when I witness to people? These TV pastors with their own Learjet. No. Right? I don't think the Apostle Paul was that way. You can talk all about following the Apostle Paul's doctrine, but what about his manner of life? It's okay to have things, and if God has materially blessed you, great. Come on, you understand that. It's okay to be affluent if God has blessed you with those things. If you're at the point where you cannot countenance your lessers, if you're to the point where you're always griping about the hotel you're put in, or there's so much food that you can't even eat, you're a cocky little punk. Though you be ordained of God. Oh, okay, I just said it. Mine not high things, but condescend to low estates. Right? If the conversation of the common man is, is so, so crude for you, <laughs> maybe you ought to take a step back. Wow, this is nice. This is good. You've lost it. You've lost it. And, and, and look, and I, can I tell you something? This, this lesson, this message, whatever it is, this, this share-a-thon, um, <laughs> I'm going to get into it here, but it, it really, this is a sermon to David Havman, what I'm about to talk about. And, and those things are sometimes, you're going to say, man, you seem f- very familiar with this subject. Well, when it's something, you know, that you've had to process in your own mind, in your own heart, you know, you tend to be familiar with it. But, but I, I just got to say that by way of introduction. And uh, we ought not to be snobs. Yes. Come on. Yeah. Amen. Come on. Don't forget where you came from. It, 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 it really it fills the tabernacle with an unholy and odiferous smoke. When that which is committed to God is cleansed by God, it's a place dedicated to offer up sacrifices of praise to Him. Then it's full of the stench of our pride and self-will and it oozes out every corner and crack of that tent. It's evident to others. So I think we ought to be careful. What are these high things? Well, I think they're contrasted with the ability to minister to men of low estate. That's what he says. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Low men, low things, common things. That, that doesn't mean base. It doesn't mean crude. That doesn't mean uh, things that are wrong or sinful. I hope you understand that. As we pan back further, I guess we can see three places where high things are actually mentioned. Look at Romans chapter 11. Look at Romans chapter 11. And he's speaking about these branches. These branches that were broken off. We know those to be Israel. 
And we see that we were grafted in. The Gentiles were grafted in. Right. We live in a country probably outside of uh, the nation of, uh, of Britain. Uh, our two countries have been more grafted in to the goodness of God, right? right, right. Than any other two nations in the history of the world. Right. And that's we're experiencing the residual effects of this. God broke off those natural branches and he, he grafted us in. Right? You have people that aren't even saved, but they exhibit Judeo-Christian values. Right? And it's nice. I don't know if you've ever traveled or if you've ever lived in a foreign country, but it's nice to live in a country where people know what a queue is. That when the stoplight goes out, they take turns and treat it like a four-way stop. All right? The law of the jungle is if I'm stronger than you, I take advantage of you. All right? And the Lord has given our culture, because of this book, a mindset toward protection of the weak. We benefit greatly from this book. You don't understand how the liberals and the God-haters don't understand. They are digging their own grave by getting rid of this book. <laughs> they are. They're our own worst enemies. All right, but look what he says here in verse 12, 20. Well, because of the unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not what? Okay. Be not high-minded, but fear. Be not high-minded in regards to the knowledge and light that God has given us in comparison with those that haven't received him. Don't get cocky just because you are so godly and so holy that you have accepted the truth. And the knaves, those who are impure of heart, can't but grasp God's glory because, simply because they are not as pure and as sensitive to God as you are. It's very easy to get conceited about the love that you have for God in the face of your lessers. Hmm? What, and what it does is it impedes your ability to minister to people. Amen. They smell it a mile off. It impedes my ability. People know if you don't like them. No amount of smiling <laughs> can make up for that. No amount of cuteness or political machinations Right? None of that. No cards. Right? No little plaques with a rock that I picked up for you in Israel. <laughs> People know if you don't like them. Oh, yeah. Exudes out your pores. I think people knew that Jesus loved them. Our spirituality reaches the point where it almost... A rancor in our hearts develops for our fellow man. And while we are separated spiritually by light years, in fact, as far as heaven is above the earth, we are separated from them. Yet in a very real aspect, we are the point of contact. The only point of contact between them and an eternity in hell. Well, so, okay, he says that. That's why he says in verse 25, uh, don't be wise in your own conceits. Look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me that every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Think soberly as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. And here we're not to be so proud that we can't humble ourselves. And you understand the context with preachers here, okay? That we are not able to humble ourselves and use the gifts, though we may consider them simple and maybe not the biggest, greatest gifts, we're to humble ourselves and use them to the benefit of the body and not say, well, that's above me. No, we ought not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. Yeah. I think we're reminded of the example of our Lord who, with supper being ended, stooped down and washed his disciples' feet. A task that, listen, was not his, but a task that he did not consider himself above. Romans chapter 13, verse 1, here's another high one. You know, Listen, I believe in the English Bible. So when I see the word high in the greater context, I know what the Lord's pointing us to. Look what he says in Romans chapter 13, verse 1, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there's no power but a God. The powers that be ordained of God. And here we're told to subject ourselves to a higher group because they're ordained of God, not because they're holy. Not because they're godly or Christian, but because it is God's authority structure. 
and, a, and, a, and a rebellion to authority, though it be, though we might disqualify it in our own minds, is still God's authority. And that's in the home, and that's in the church, and that's in government. We understand that. But the problem is, is that we have a spirit of rebellion. See, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a pride. There's, we think ourselves more highly than we ought to think. We are wise in our own conceits, and even in chapter 13, not being subject, we are rebellious. And perhaps it's these things, the arrogance, the conceit, and the rebellion, that contribute in some subconscious way to our elevating ourselves and our ideals above others to the point where we cannot even minister the Word of God to them, I just wonder. Wonder. He says, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low of state. It's interesting because in Romans chapters 1 through 11, we have just left the peaks of doctrinal greatness, have we not? Yeah. I mean, we have soared with Paul through the universe to the point where he says, neither height nor depth nor things present nor things to come may be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The fact of the matter is, is there are high things that we are to be occupied with. Sure. Set your affections on things above and not on things of earth. But as we descend into the practical here, if we could say descend, he says, be careful. Be careful. Boast not thyself uh, against the natural branches. And I think sometimes what we assume, what we boast about, what we robe ourselves with, with our highest ideals, is just really chicanery. Thinly veiled in religiosity and a desire to, for the truth. It is high things that often excuse our unwillingness to humble ourselves, and I'll explain that. We can take this very practically. Look at Romans chapter 14, verse 1, where he says, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Here's a very practical uh, lesson here, application of this concept in Romans 12, 16, to not mind high things. Why? Because you know that you can eat anything. Right? You understand that in doctrine. You understand that your soul has been separated from your body, right? And it cannot anymore be defiled by physical means. Right? You can't be separated. You learn that in the book of Romans. Yeah. You see? And so we understand that I can eat anything. In fact, we understand that an idol is nothing. It's nothing. Right? But it's something to somebody. Right? And so here's a high doctrinal truth. And I'm to forego the application of it. Right? So that I don't offend a weaker brother because that is a great sin. In fact, if I offend my brother's conscience... I sin against Christ. But it is so easy for us to excuse our behavior and excuse our actions that really are essentially we don't give a flip about anybody but ourselves by saying, well, look, this is what the Bible says. An idol is nothing, so whatever. Okay. We can take it very practically. Meats for the body. The body for meats. The Lord shall destroy both it and them, right? Huh. Vote for the Trump and Trump for the vote. The Lord shall destroy both it and them. <laughs> you see, what are you talking about? Verse 2 in chapter 13, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they shall receive in themselves damnation. What damnation? Damnation of their conscience. That's why he says in verse 5, Wherefore you must needs be subject not only for wrath, but for conscience' sake. Look, there's, I, I, there's, it's not without significance that I believe this dovetails in the last couple sermons that we've heard. You know, somebody here must be, you just must be a stinker. <laughs> Gotta be careful about offending people's conscience on things that don't matter. Amen. Amen. Come on. Amen. You know, I don't... To, to be perfectly honest with you, I can read. 
So I don't need you to tell me who to vote for. In fact, as a pastor, it's really not your job. Sorry, but it's true. I have someone asked me one time, does a person have to be a Republican to go to your church? That's a, that's a fair question. When, come on, they're not that very far apart. No, listen, I have my opinions on it. Don't you? Should. I, I feel personal responsibility to have some engagement in the voting process because it would offend my conscience if I didn't. Right? And if I feel that, and I've been studying the Bible for a long time, then imagine weaker people that are raised with a sense of responsibility toward their government and toward their community. And you get up in the pulpit and call Trump a moron. Why? Because on this level, you're absolutely right. Sure, he's an ungodly man. Come on! Oh, oh, are you with me? They're talking about Biden being a pervert. They're all perverts! But I'm making an issue out of something that goes into the realm of someone's conscience, and I need to be careful. Right? You get in the habit of offending your conscience, you go down a very bad road. Right? So if you feel like people don't have the political views you have, first of all, it's not my job to conform you to my political mindset. It's my job to lead you in your relationship with Christ. Okay, but I'm telling you, and it goes both ways, it's a subject that, 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 that we feel compelled to, to always address, and there's someone in there, we're going to wound their conscience for as... Pastor Baker said, and I'm all for doing your part, by the way. Don't get me wrong. But it's something that we're not necessarily commissioned to do. Come on, come on. The nations are a drop in the bucket. We know that. We know that, right? But if my conscience compels me to a level of participation, simply for the fact that enough people shed their blood so that I could walk in and vote, all right? Don't call me stupid, because I don't understand that it's all going downhill anyways. Oh, you are so smart. Please, teach me more. I don't get that at all. I'm a moron. (laughs) I understand all that, right? But there's, there's responsibility. By the way, who cares what happens in Washington? You know what we have on our ballot this, this year? Legalizing marijuana. Now, whatever you care about the swamp, and it's a swamp. They are crooked as H-E double hockey stick. I do care whether there's a pot shop down the street from where my kids play basketball. Right? So I can vote on that. Am I allowed? Right? Right? And and look, it goes both ways. All I'm saying is it's an issue where you are bound to offend someone's weaker conscience, as I probably already have. (laughs) Because we have all knowledge. Well, I have all knowledge. Yes, you do have all knowledge. But a greater knowledge is destroy not thy brother for whom Christ died. Right? Right? I love the song, in shady green pastures so rich and so sweet, God leads his dear children along. You know, perhaps we should lead into a greater understanding of what it means to be a Christian and not to be completely swayed or ride the emotional roller coaster of the politics of our day. But that doesn't happen overnight. Okay, well, okay. High things can often retard our obedience to a plain and simple truth. When an abstract ideal causes us to violate more plain and simple commands. Yeah. That's philosophy, right? That's philosophy. That's where I make up an excuse, an intellectual excuse, to, dis- to, ex- to excuse the obedience to revealed truth. Right? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Well, I mean, really. If God created the heaven and the earth, where did God come from? We realize that all that is is a question to excuse your rejection of the truth, right? You do it too, and so do I. (laughs) 
You know what the Bible says? It says, he that spareth his rod hateth his son. You say, you like spanking my kids? I hate spanking my kids. The Bible says to do it. You know, you, know, you know what we're tempted to do because we're cowards and we don't want our kids to be mad at us? Yeah. We say, well, God has mercy with me, so yeah. I'll yeah. be mercy. Well, I don't want to be strict with my kids because my parents were strict with me and I rebelled. You ever heard that one? Sure. Mm-hmm. You just revealed something about yourself right there. You just blamed your rebellion on your parents and you're 40 years old. You're 40 years old and you got kids and you're raising them and you still haven't figured out the basic concept that you are responsible for your actions? Because you think your parents turned you off. At least you had something to rebel against. For a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. All right? Let's just be honest. I'm a coward and I don't want my kid to be upset with me. Help me, Lord. Instead of, right? Instead of saying, well, you know, I just don't want to put the tree in the garden because that gives Eve something to rebel against, right? You just made sin God's fault. Right? Oh, you're really smart. You know? But I have wandered in the wilderness of esoterics too long. Now I'm coming home. The way of the righteous is made plain. Yes, it it's yes. plain. Yes. That's the problem. It's too plain for you. Yeah. And it's too plain for me. So we go into the world of higher thoughts and higher learning yeah. to excuse our cowardice. Yeah. Okay. You say, why? you say, wow, you, sh- you have a familiarity with this. Yes, I'm preaching to me. <laughs> it's very easy to do. Some of us are more this way than others, right? Some of you excuse your dirty rock and roll music. Okay. <laughs> By saying, well, no one really knows what good or bad music is. So we're not going to draw a line at all. I agree, there is a gray area. Right? But you create the gray area so that you can keep your music that you haven't got the victory over yet. Can I promise you that, I promise you, if you don't get rid of that garbage, your children will be worldly. I promise you. But uh, no one really knows where, where, if it's bad. Well, it's, Af- it's listen, it's, it's West African Haitian voodoo music. And, that's right. And you know what you say to me? Well, that's just because you went to that school and you're a racist. Oh, so now you're using, so now you're using the same argument as BLM, right? Like Michelle Obama, well, I know you disagree with me because I'm black and I'm a woman. You play the race card. Let me ask you a question. When I preach against Thor, the god of thunder, does that make me hate white people? So why when I preach against music that has been developed for centuries, not just in West Africa, but also in Celtic and Nordic cultures long before the Bible even showed up, to conjure up evil spirits that puts a person in a passive state and opens them up for devil possession and sensual desires. It is a fact. But because you want to keep your dirty rock and roll music, you will corrupt your children and you'll listen to that garbage. And far, as far as I'm concerned, this Christian rock these days, it ain't any different than Fleetwood Mac or any of them. Okay, you're welcome. But no one really knows where it is. Well, you're right. So there you go. But it's right in front of your face, and you know it. All right, five more minutes. Now watch this. Wow. I didn't mean to say any of that. Look, people in our churches get sick. This is, <laughs> I came to a guy one time and I said, listen, brother, pray for me. I'm having some issues. A pastor, 20 years older than me in the Lord, right? Which I expected him to say, let me give you a couple verses and pray with you, Dave. You know what he said? I can help you with that. I'm sell- He's selling vitamins. I know, you watched about five hours of videos and now you know more than doctors. Okay, now look. 
I don't want him to heal me physically. He's got something much better than that that I need. I need spiritual and emotional support, okay? But you know what we do? We tend to mind high things, and it pulls us out of a place where we can minister to people. So when Mrs. So-and-so says, can you come down to the hospital and pray for me? I'm about to start chemo. I don't go down there and say, now you know you're putting poison in your body, and it's not the cancer that's going to kill you. It's the chemo. No, I say, let's pray, Mrs. Jones. Because I know what the Lord can do for you, and I'm not a doctor. I pray God will give you grace and strength. You, and that might be true. That's not the point. It's over my head. And you know what I do when I go over to sister so-and-so, who's not taking chemo? right? I go over there, and she's having her bath of turmeric. You know, and I go in, and incense assaults me as I go in the room. And I feel like it's the 60s. Right? Oh, wow, Mrs. Mrs. Smith, you literally covered every inch of your body with turmeric. Now I need you. Okay, well, let's take your hand. We need to pray. Okay, no, I need you to reach your hand out. I'm afraid of grabbing the wrong appendage. You know? You definitely did a thorough job there. <laughs> and do you know what I say when Mrs. Smith is taking her turmeric bath? I say, Lord, God, give Mrs. Smith the grace and give her some scripture. Because right, that's what she needs from me. Right? And I, I, need, I might think I'm smart. Now, what is it with this obsession these days that we have to know, be experts on everything? <laughs> I'm not. That's, our society does that, right? So LeBron James tells you who to vote for. What does he know? Right? I, I don't need that from him. And my people don't need that from me. Mine not high things. I just cut half of the people off I can minister to by dabbling in things I have no business dabbling in. You know, but, but you know things, right? You know things. It's much simpler than that. It is the way of the righteous. Don't you remember when people just got sick? <laughs> you ever read in the Old Testament? Some of you are so offended right now. Because this book is not in you, your stupid website is. Okay. Amen. How was there a plague in numbers when there was no CIA? I just had to say. Hey, do you, I think someone somewhere is making bioweapons? Absolutely. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. But people just get sick. And whether it's the CIA or Bill Gates or God or the devil, they're sick. He whom thou lovest is sick. Right? Well, send him a bottle of this. Nah. I got the glory of God going on here. We got bigger stuff to deal with. Now look, look at this, just about done. Okay. Remember Daniel? Boy, did Daniel see some high things? <sighs> Saw that angel on the banks of Uli, with feet of brass, eyes of a flame of fire. Daniel enter into some deep things. Yeah. Do you know how he got to that place? Not by being smart. Simple obedience. You know how Daniel became the man that God revealed more to him about prophecy until John showed up? It started out by saying, I can't eat that pig. The Bible tells me so. It started out with, O oh, king, God's raised you up, and if you don't get right, you're going down. He wasn't afraid to tell the truth. It started with, you haven't regarded the God that your father knew. This is your last night in town, cowboy, in Daniel chapter 5. And it started with a simple command. You can't pray before me. And he opened his windows. Just follow what he knew to be true. I know what you do, and I know what I do. We invent a more complex Christianity that people can't attain to. 
right? So that we become the self-fulfilling prophecy of look at the apostasy. Imagine getting to heaven and the Lord's like, well, I got a crown for you. It's a crown of life, which I give to everybody that loves my appearing. Okay. Mm. Yeah, you missed some stuff. You took the vaccine. Sorry, but that is part of the mystery of iniquity. <laughs> yeah, I'm not for the max. I'm not for the vaccine, right? But tell that to your missionaries. Right? You have a chance to go preach someone the gospel, and they say. I'm going to give you this shot, and you know that shot might give you autism, which, let's face it, some of you would probably be smarter if you got autism. Okay? And he says, you can go to China, but you have to get this shot first, and you say, well, you know what? I don't want my liver to crash when I'm 85, so I can't take that. I guess the people in China will have to go to hell. No, if you're a missionary, you know what you do? You say, you want it here or here? You guys in the military, they poked you with everything. You didn't care. You had a greater calling. All right? I'm not saying it's, I'm not, saying it's not a bad thing. No, but, but listen, listen. Oh, boy. <laughs> Mind not high things. Condescend to men of low estate. And, and, we, and we, 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 we take ourselves out of, of the ability to, to minister to people. Listen to me. Did it matter? If there was not a behind-the-scenes conspiracy to catch Daniel in praying... If it was just a random idea of the king, would it, would, it, would it make a difference if he obeyed or not? I don't care if our government's doing this garbage because it's satanic or not. All that matters is our response. Imagine the Lord saying to you when you get to heaven, hmm. She took the vaccine. I'm like, Lord, I looked in Scripture, and I didn't see where you didn't want me to take it. And he said, oh, that's your problem. You looked in the Bible. Now, if you go to the Drudge Report and follow this link, you can see that the company that invented this vaccine is associated with 666 here, here, and here. So, in fact, he flips the screen around and shows you. So sorry, but... I'm going to give your crown to the Freeman and the KKK. <laughs> now look, I'm going to say this. I'm done. Okay, can I say this? Yeah, whatever you want to say. That's just free. <laughs> <laughs> can I say this? Can I say this? And I want this is I want because I want to end spirit. I want to end. I want to end being an encouragement to you. Okay. Uh, we adopt an unrealistic ideal that impedes our ability to minister to sinners. In Romans chapter 12, he says, be not high-minded. He said, don't think of yourself more highly than not to think. A Christianity that prohibits me being able to bridge the gap is no Christianity at all. That's what killed the evangelical movement was the deeper lifers. They did. They took us off the street and they put us up on the mountain. Were, were our prideful entrance into the deeper things of God was somehow more important than what he commissioned us to do. Now, I don't have time for that, but you can look it up. It is very true. I just want to say this, because we've talked about this. Are you tired? Because I am. Pastors, are you tired? Pastors' wives, are you tired? Okay. And I know that we, we come here and, and we want to be around each other. Okay? And we need that, the, the professional camaraderie that we have between pastors. Okay? Yes. But you're part of the body of Christ. You need to allow your people to minister to you in the way that they know how. Because they can refresh you as Barzillai the Gileadite and as Anisiphorus and as Priscilla and Aquila. And they might not be able to sit down with you and talk about the Bible like you want to. 
but you can just get in the boat and go fishing with them and have a day where you don't have to talk about anything at all. And pastor's wives, let me tell you what you do. I love you. Our pastor's wives are killing themselves. Why? Because you think every time you get together with the ladies in your church, you have to teach them something. Actually, their husbands are supposed to teach them at home. Pastor's wife is not the pastor of the women in the church. The pastor is the pastor of the men, and the men pastor their wives. You're welcome. I'm here all day. Now listen. You are killing your wife. There's no qualifications for the pastor's wife in the New Testament. And you sit down and you put pressure on yourself to conform the ladies in your church into your spiritual image when really, just sit down and talk about Hobby Lobby. I mean it. You are killing yourself because every time you go out to eat with someone in your church, you feel like you have to instruct them on something. No, just get in the boat, eat some barbecue, go fishing, pass some gas. But you are so stinking spiritual that you cannot countenance the ungodliness in your church people. And so even when you go to Perkins, you have to have a teaching moment. And you are killing yourself. You know what? If they just want you to come over at the house and sit around and play bocce ball, then just play bocce ball. You already preach to them from the pulpit. They're fine. They can't absorb anymore. Right? Right? But you are so impressed with your own walk with the Lord that you have to superimpose it on other people. And you're killing yourself. Now, I'm not saying that this isn't awesome. We need this. But you know what? There are people in this church today that minister to me. Jason and Kelly and Josh and Jody and Dan and Julie. Right? And they don't have the Bachelor Divinity on their wall. Who cares? We get together and we talk about our kids. Let your people love you. Because human needs can only be met by human means. And God wants to let the people in your church minister to you. And you won't let them. Because some big shot fundamentalist told you you can't get close to them. And that might work in some worlds, but in a small town in Montana, they won't give you the time of day if you're a snob. That's just the way it is. It might, it's different in bigger cities. It's different in different cultures. I understand that. But I'm telling you, you are divorcing yourself from the divine means that God has implemented to produce peace and comfort and strength in you. And so let your people love you the way they know how. Father.